matrimonial society, okay? So everything that we trace goes to our mothers. So everybody in, in, in modern society and everything like that, we're more of a patriarch or a patrilineal society where you take your father's last name. So for me, my, my mother is of the Wolf Clan, my father is of the Heron Clan. And traditionally what it was supposed to be was that you would marry somebody opposite of your clan. So we have eight bird, we have eight clans all together. We have four birds and we have four animal clans. So you're supposed to marry a cross so that way you're not going to marry your cousin. You don't want to piss your cousin on the back of it, okay? So you don't want two wolves marrying things like that. You can't have an issue that way, you know? So, so we were a, a primitive people in some people's minds, but I think we were very sophisticated in who we were as a people. Um, has anybody ever heard we were a Quaker Confederacy? Does anybody know anything about it at all? I know the history at all. Okay. I heard, right, so I heard of it, a yeah. brief history lesson that we're going to give you, okay? So originally there were five nations that lived here in upstate New York, okay? There were five nations that were battling against one another, okay? And they were all fighting with each other and they were at war. There was a time that it was really kind of getting decimated. What we were fighting over was territories and properties and things like that and just kind of resources and things like that here in the area. And so a man came amongst us. Now this man was said to have been a pretty special person. He was born across Lake, Lake Ontario, which is uh, probably about an hour and a half, two hours north of here. And uh, he was said to have been from the Erie people. And uh, this man was born, this is maybe sort of prodigal son sort of story or something like that. He was married, he was born to a woman that didn't have a husband. So how did this happen? Nobody knows. But it, you know, I guess in the context of it all, it makes him a pretty special person. On top of that, okay, this man, paddled a canoe across Lake Ontario. This, this, this canoe was made out of stone. So I don't know how you paddle a stone canoe, but as soon as you show up on the shores and somebody sees you just paddle across the lake in a stone canoe, you all of a sudden got somebody's attention. Somebody's gonna pay attention to what you got to say, okay? So, he understood that there was a lot of trouble that was going on up here. There was a lot of battle and bloodshed and things like that. And he thought, and he had a vision, that there was a better way to do things, okay? That it was important that we had to take care of each other and that it was, this wasn't the way that the Creator had meant us to live and, and who we were supposed to be. So basically his idea was to try and join all the nations together into a confederacy so that we could all work together to then, you know, um, share resources and protect ourselves against any outside other tribes, okay? So the one thing that he did was he actually took um, some, some uh, tutelage from a, a, a woman her name was Jigon Sasa. They call her the mother of nations. And uh, Jigon Sasa was an interesting person because in a lot of history books and things like that that you guys all read, you don't hear about a lot of women. Okay? So that again harkens back to like the idea of us being a matrilineal society. That's where we get a lot of our, our, uh, our knowledge from or even kind of our leadership from. Even though we have chiefs and things like that in our, in our history now, it was actually the women who were behind us kind of pulling the strings, kind of the puppet masters. Okay? They were the ones that were kind of guiding us and directing us because they have the ability to give life. Okay? So if any of you guys have a mom or any of you guys have a sister or anything like that, that woman's going to go through a lot more difficult things than you and I will ever experience, and that's giving birth. Okay? That's a whole different ballgame. Okay? So there's a lot of respect that go to women, I think, in our, in our opinions, because of the ability to give life. Okay? So, Peacemaker, he, he took, um, you know, he took the, um, the, uh, the direction of, of um, uh, Jigon Sasa, but he also worked with another man, um, the Ganawida, they call him. And so the, the three of these people came together and they formulated a plan that the best way to get all of these nations together was to prove to them you know, how, how feeble they were as one, as one nation. Okay? So, the, so the, the metaphor is, or what he would use was one arrow. Okay? He would take one arrow and break it over his knee very easily. He said, you see that one arrow by itself? How easily that can be defeated in battle? So that's not how it's going to work, okay? So what, you, what he did was he took five arrows and tied them together, okay? He took the five arrows and he tried to break them over his knee. He couldn't break the five arrows. Hey, you got a dollar bill in your pocket right now? Okay. Alright. Very good. So turn it around. What do you have on those dollar bills? Nope, that's right. You got a pyramid on one side and a bird on the other, right? Okay, so you got an eagle on the other side, right? And you guys know what the... What, there's, there's arrows in his hands, right? In that eagle's hands? How many are on there? No. Thirteen. Okay. Thirteen colonies, right? Okay, are we starting to see a, a pattern here? Alright, so, five nations together join would be like a fist. It'd be so strong that nobody could break that, okay? Nobody could defeat us in battle. So that was the idea. That was the first formation of the Iroquois Confederacy. That was the first draft 
of the U.S. Constitution, democracy, okay? The first democracy in the world was formed here in a primitive land where we were savages and heathens and all the other horrible things that history books like to call us. But we were actually very civilized people. We actually had a confederacy. We had our own system of governance, our own system of, um, of, of agriculture as well. So, Thomas Jefferson and all those people, George Washington, they had strong relationships with the Iroquois Confederacy early on and understood that they were a very powerful people, you know, in terms of uh, their leadership, in terms of their, their understanding of government and how to govern themselves. And so they borrowed a lot of the ideas for the U.S. Constitution when they were writing it. The one thing that they left out of that that we held very dear and near to our heart was the women. So how long was it before the women finally got their rights to vote? So right up the road here in Fenton Falls is where the Women's Suffrage uh, Museum is. So that history actually happened in this area as well. And those same women borrowed a lot of the ideas from our clan mothers, the women, and that's where they got the idea for the women's liberation and all those sort of ideas, okay? Harriet Tubman's, her house is right up the road here as well. So you're living in a, you're in a very unbelievable place in terms of the real foundation and the roots of this country. A lot of that stuff happened right here in our backyard here, okay? So that's just a basic overlay of who we are as a people. So can any of you name the five, five original nations in the Iroquois Confederacy? Seminoles? Nope. That's south. That's Florida. Okay, so you're, you got Onondaga. Yep, that's one. Okay. Oh. Erie. Erie's, the Erie's actually got wiped out by us and we absorbed them. So they're part of us now, but they're no longer named known as the Erie's. Seneca. Yes, exactly. Actually, Seneca is a word that we don't use for ourselves. We call ourselves the Onondaga Walk now, which means people of the Great I'm actually a member of the Seneca. Okay. So I'll, give, I'll, I'll go ahead and help you guys out here. Okay, what do you got? Mohawk, yes, okay, very good. All right, so one last thing for you guys to understand about the formation of the Confederacy itself. So there was a man who was said to have been a cannibal, okay? And this was a man who was said to be one of the most evil, ruthless people. He was a sorcerer, he was kind of a bad-minded mind person. He had snakes in his hair, okay? And so, in order, for get, in order to get all of the people in the Confederacy, after he, he showed them that, like, okay, the five arrows can't break together, now, what we have to do is we have to convince the worst of the bunch. We have to go and convince the guy who is the absolute worst to buy into this before all the rest of the Confederacy would buy into him, okay, and buy into this idea. So what they did was, they went and talked to this man, Tadadaho, and basically what they talked to him about was that you're going to be the leader of this whole thing, and we're going to convince you that, you know, you're going to be the guy, and what we're going to do is we're going to put you in charge of this. However, all of our chiefs and all of our people are all equal amongst each other, okay? No one person is better than the other, but we always have the guidance and the direction of the women behind us. And so basically, metaphorically, they combed the snakes out of Tadadaho's hair in order to get him to, to sign on and to, to buy into the idea. And once that happened, that's when everybody else came on board and then decided they were going to follow the Confederacy. So, the Keepers of the Central Fire, excuse me, is where Onondaga is now. That's Syracuse, New York, okay? Furthest to the west, the last holdouts of anybody else that wanted to be a part of this was the Seneca Nation. They were a warrior tribe. They're the ones that wiped out the Erie's. That's my people. They were said to have gone all the way out to Illinois and those areas and just battled and did all sorts of horrible, heinous things. They finally convinced the Senecas to come on, so they said, okay, well, you're going to have a title. You're going to be the keepers of the western door. Now to the, to the east are the Mohawks, okay? And they're going to be the keepers of the eastern door. And in between there, you're going to have the Oneidas, which is just east of Syracuse. And right here, where we're at right now, this is the traditional homeland and territory of the Cayuga Nation. Okay, so this is where we're at right now, is the original territory of the Cayuga Nation. So, the five nations, we had it all sprawled out throughout New York State. You had the eastern door all hemmed up and locked down. That was going to be with the Mohawks. To the west, you had the Senecas. And the Central Fire, which is kind of our central capital, is on Adaga. And that's where you guys were at yesterday in Syracuse. I wish you guys would have had an opportunity to go up there and play. That would have been a really neat opportunity for you guys. Um, and there's a really special person that actually lives there. Uh, his name is Elfie Jock. Um, a lot of you guys could probably go on YouTube and find something about Elfie. Uh, there's a really great documentary that I just posted on the, the American Indian Program's webpage um, about Alfie and just his stick-making process and all of that, and that's where this thing came from. Has anybody ever seen one of these? Anybody know what this is made out of? Hickory. Oh. Yep, hickory. Okay, any reason why hickory? Anybody know? What's that? It's a strong wood, but it's also very pliable. What does that mean? Flexible, bendable, yeah. But 
what that means is what you do is when you cut this tree down, and you don't just go out and just cut some random tree down, we we're very selective about the types of woods that we want to use, and we we're very selective about the trees that we want to use because you want to be, you know, thinking about the future. One of the ideas that we have, and whenever we make decisions, we talked about, you know, our system of governance and things like that. In order for us to make a decision to do something, we have to come to a forum. That is a consensus, I'm sorry, exactly. Consensus. So it's, a, it's, it's an agreement that everybody comes together, that everybody has to agree to this decision before we make that decision. So it's not a majority rule sort of idea. Can you imagine trying to figure anything out, make a decision, it was just going to be, you know, we had to get all of you guys to agree to one thing in order to make something happen. There's a lot of things I could probably convince you of to be able to do that. But if an idea wasn't going to fly the first time around, we'd, we'd table it and then we would come back to that idea. Okay? So that was the process there. So the, one of the ideas that we have as well is thinking about the seventh generation to come. So any decision that we make today is going to affect seven generations down the road. So when we go and cut a tree down, we're not just going to cut down the biggest, mightiest, strongest tree that we see out there. We're going to go and cut down a tree that we feel is going to be a good one because in the essence of that tree, okay, is the spirit of that tree. It's the spirit of the woods, okay? There's a strength and there's a beauty there. People walk past trees and plants all the time and don't really consider the fact that they're actually alive and they're actually a part of, you know, this whole thing, the Tinoet, which we call Mother Earth, okay? Okay, so we're all a part of that. You guys are a small part of that whole thing, okay? This is all going to go on after you are all here, and dead and gone or whatever. You know, this is all still going to sustain itself. It's going to keep going on and doing what it's supposed to be doing. But that's where the strength of this game comes from. So actually, the game itself comes from Mother Earth, okay? Because of those trees that we use. And this is where it came from. And this game was given to us as a gift from the Creator. This is a game that we play for His enjoyment, okay? So one of the things that you know, frustrates me a little bit about the current game of lacrosse that we see is there's a whole lax bro culture that's kind of going around. It's this kind of edgy, sort of kind of, you know, I'm on the fringe, I'm kind of this you know, tough guy, bad guy, look at me, kind of, you know, those sort of guys. I know Coach, Coach Johnson doesn't teach those sort of things with guys, you know. I think he's got a better understanding. Coach Riley, same sort of thing, you know. Uh, both come from very great programs. Coach Riley comes from Corning East. You know, that was one of the most amazing programs when I was growing up. I was fortunate enough to grow up in this area. You know, I played in Syracuse, watched a lot of Cornell games, watched a, lot of, watched a ton of Hobart games. Um, you know, grew up in a hotbed of lacrosse. But really, guys, it's about honoring the game. And for us, you know, playing lacrosse, it's not about winning or losing. It's more about how you play the game. Okay? It's more about, you know, what effort did you give when you were out there? And how did you compete? Did you play at your highest peak level? And the biggest thing about that, guys, is playing with a good mind. Okay? It's always going on the field, and you're not going on the field. You know, somebody might have slashed you, somebody might have did something to you, you know, give you a butt end or whatever else. You gotta, you gotta push that stuff away, guys. Okay, you gotta go out there and play with a good mind. You're not out there to hurt somebody. You know, the ideas and the stories about this being like a little brother of war. Okay, that's not really the true essence of the game. It was a part of it, guys. That there was people who died in battle, who died in the, in the cross games and things like that. But that was a product of the game of people playing hard. But it wasn't the goal to go out there and kill somebody and club somebody over the head with a stick. Okay. It was actually a medicine game. It was something that was used to heal people, any of the community members or anything like that who needed medicine, who needed the strength. The team would come together, the players would come together, and they would play and they would give the medicine, and they would burn tobacco before that, and then they would play the game and try to heal somebody. And the harder you played, the stronger the medicine was. And so that was the idea and the concept of it. And when the French and the Europeans came over, they saw how brutal and rough and tough the game was. They were, they were horrified by it at first, but then they were kind of sickly, you know, kind of attracted to it because of, like, how crazy of a sport it was, you know? And so, um, you know, it was one of those things that it was a very special game. So in our language, we actually, in, in Seneca language, we call this Dewakia, okay? Now, everybody calls it the, to, the Tawaratan Trophy, okay? You can't imagine how many Mohawk people that drives nuts to hear Quinn Kessler br brutalizing the language, okay? The actual pronunciation of the Tawaratan Trophy should be Dewale Hadoum, okay? Dewale Hadoum, which means basically the lacrosse stick or the stick game, okay? Now, for the Iroquois Nationals, we have, a, we have a, on, on the back of our shorts and inside of our jerseys, we have another word that says Tejon Chikwa S. Tejon Chikwa S means they bump hips, and that's another word for the game of lacrosse. Why do you think it's called that? What's that? 
Set. Yep. Yep. Pushing and fighting for ground balls. Okay. So the ball's on the ground a lot because people can't pass and catch it. But you know, the ball's always on the ground. So a lot, of the, a lot of the game is played on the ground. So you're bumping hips, trying to jockey and push and whatever else, fight for the ground balls, but that's what that's all about. So te ho chi class is a word that you can say that's the Anadaka word for the cross, but the wala, the wala hadu is actually what the Dwarakon trophy means, okay, and that's what that actually is. And it's just a stick game, okay, the ball and stick game. Um, but really having very spiritual and significant meaning to our people. Um, you know, traditionally it was a game that was only played by the men. Um, so the women didn't play lacrosse originally, and there's a lot of kind of um, ideas out there that the women shouldn't be playing the game of lacrosse. I think I'm a little bit more progressive. Yeah. Why, why? It was a medicine game, and it was something that also, because of the fact that like there was kind of an, an element of like um, battle and war and things like that, because women were sacred and could give birth, they didn't want them being involved in something violent like that. So there's a little bit more of a kind of a cultural sort of idea behind that. Um, I think I'm a little bit more progressive in the idea that I think that it's an opportunity for our young women to, to go off and go to school. There's a lot of lacrosse opportunities out there for young women today. And, you know, for me, I think it's great for our young women to be educated and to be able to pass that on. Because as a people, as a, as a native people, we've been relegated to history books in a lot of ways. You know, it wasn't until recently that we've had a couple of guys that really